All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to the science seminar. Hope you found a seat. But there's not too many seats left. There's still seats available there if you guys want to sneak in. Right? Yeah, we're going to be standing room only in here until we're in the old days. Right? Okay. So, um, for today, uh, we have our own Dr. Morris, who all of you guys know. And he probably doesn't need an introduction, but we'll introduce him just the same. So, Dr. Morris comes to us from um, ETBU, which is a sister school down the road over there in uh, Marshall, Texas, right? And he also comes to us as um, living in this area. You grew up around Houston, is that right? Houston area, yeah. Yep. And he went to Stephen F. Austin, which is a little bit north of Houston, on his way to Longview, right? <laughs> there for his um, undergraduate. Then he overshot maternal and went to um, Arkansas, for his graduate studies in, in chemistry. But then he found his way back to Longview, but didn't quite make it when he went to Marshall there at NTBU. But now he finally found his way home and finally landed here in, in Longview after that, you know, down below, overshot, come back, but not quite hit it, and now he's with us. And we're all very happy that he is here. And um, we hope that, you know, all of you register for organic chemistry in the fall and I'm appreciate him as your chemistry professor, right? So um, today he's going to talk to us about chemical discoveries that change the world. And we had some discussion about this title. First there was like, you know, the great things that chemistry has brought, and we said, well, maybe they weren't so great after all. Maybe there should be the curses of chemistry. No, no, they're not curses. They're not blessings. Well, we'll just talk about them as big things, yes? And um, he's going to tell you about some of these big things that have happened in chemistry and how they've affected the world, and hopefully we'll have some good discussion about that. And I would also encourage you to join us for lunch after the seminar to further this discussion. If you're a student who doesn't have a meal plan, we've got you covered. If you're a commuting student who doesn't have a meal plan, we've got you covered. If you're visiting here as a dual enrollment student or just visiting, we've got you covered. So if you want to join us for lunch, we'll be in the Joyce Room of the Corner Cafe. So let's give um, Dr. Morris a uh, voice for lunch. Thank you, Dr. DeBoer, and thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to be here at Letourneau. I'm so excited to give this talk. Um, and so it was very hard to choose, but I think this is really going to spark a lot of great and fantastic discussion on this campus. And um, speaking of what Dr. DeBoer was talking about, you know, I, I did have kind of a borderline crisis about my career because it does seem like chemists have contributed a lot to the detriment of society. And, but that, that actually is not true, okay? That's not true, and chemistry has done fantastic things for society as well, and we can further talk about why I believe that as well. But <clears throat> here's some chemical discoveries that changed the world. So when preparing a seminar like this, uh, me being a trained synthetic organic chemist, you know, I, I tend to want to look at some organic chemistry kinds of applications, but not necessarily the best thing for a general audience, so I also wanted to expand my, uh, knowledge reservoir. So how did I choose? <clears throat> well, I wanted a variety. I just didn't want to stick to pharmaceuticals or foodstuffs or, you know, synthetic fertilizers or things of that sort. I wanted a variety so y'all can see in the various ways. I wanted to talk about the level of impact because there's a lot of great things that happen in chemistry, but the impact hasn't been global. And so I wanted to talk about things that were far reaching. Interesting history was a very fun thing to look up into. And so the topics I'm talking about today, hopefully you'll agree with me, have a very interesting and dynamic history and how they play out, <clears throat> how it affects us today. And also, I want to spark meaningful discussion. So as I come here to y'all in seminar, I admit I am not the leading expert in anything that I'm talking about today, but I, ra I rather want to just sample these things for y'all. We're in a 50-minute seminar. I can't get too in-depth on any of these subjects, but I wanted to spark discussion I'm going to talk about how chemists don't work in isolation and how culture affects what happens in the lab and things of that sort. <clears throat> and, um, and so I want to give credit to some books that have inspired me. And as you look at this list, I'm sure you're already thinking, well, why didn't he include this book or that book? And the, the reason is very simple. I have a full-time job and three kids under six years old. I don't have time <laughs> to read 150 books prepping for seminar. But I was inspired by Pandora's Lab and Stuff Matters, Liquid Rules, and Napoleon's Buttons. And I know there's The Dissolving Spoon and other fantastic books out there, 
but uh, these served as my inspiration for this talk. Okay. Before I get into it, though, um, I understand that not everybody's had organic chemistry, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just give you a very brief slide on how to read organic structures. And so, for y'all, for some of y'all, this is easy. For others, this might come to a surprise because we've all seen those people walking around holding their coffee cups with some lines on it and they say that's the structure of caffeine, right? And now you might actually be able to analyze what it is. So here's a structure. We call it the structural formula of butane. A couple features is that organic compounds or the study of organic chemistry is generally defined as the study of carbon-based compounds. <laughs> and carbon can bond to a number of things, but one key feature is that to be neutral, they like to have four bonds, okay? And so, we oftentimes, instead of writing it in that format, you'll see it written like a zigzag line shown here. <clears throat> um, in organic chemistry, that actually is full of information. And so just to keep you up to date with this talk, the ends of lines in the corners represent carbon atoms that are to be implied. And then each carbon that you see has enough hydrogens to make four total bonds, okay? So that's how you read these things. And it's helpful because who wants to draw the structure of amoxicillin right there? <laughs> Takes a while, right? And so this structure can be condensed down into the skeletal formula, which looks like that. Yes, it's the racemic form. I know moxicillin does have stereocenters, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna be utilizing these kinds of structures here for the rest of the talk. So the first subject I'm gonna start with is called tasty science. <laughs> tasty science, okay? You know, <clears throat> I just thought we'd ease into this talk with something fun to talk about, something that's delectable. And so, many of y'all might recognize the title of this slide, Come With Me and You'll Be in a World of Pure Imagination. Ah, yes. Where does that come from, Cla class? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Willy Wonka. So, engineering plus chemistry plus culture plus centuries of work, culinary effort, persistence, and counterintuitive thinking gives you, class, it's not Long John Silver's. It is <laughs> chocolate. Okay, we're going to be talking about chocolate, of which... If you were to ask me which chocolate reigns superior, it would have to be the Kit Kat, okay? And we can have a heated discussion about this later, um, but I do think the crunch does add to the uh, psychophysics effect of me enjoying it. But yes, chocolate has impacted our society. It's hard to go anywhere and not realize the impact of chocolate. It's in our chocolate chip cookies, it's in fondue, it's in the molten lava cake at Chili's, right? It's a hard coating on ice cream. It, gives rise to Valentine's Day and Easter, and a lot of great things come from our knowledge of chocolate, but it might be hard to believe that chocolate has not always been around in the way that we know and enjoy it today, okay? And it's kind of interesting how chocolate got its rise. So I'm gonna go quickly through the history. I'm happy to talk more about this in discussion after seminar. But it dates back to uh, you know some of the earliest civilizations, uh, 2,000 years before Christ, people were using the cacao, seeds or the cacao pods in terms of like manufacturing currency. You're going to see they used it as currency in Mesoamerica, <clears throat> but also they, they actually ground it up into a gritty and kind of oily beverage called chocolatel, which starts with an X. Um, fast forward, it enters, we enter uh, past Christ. We are at 1500s. It, it spreads through Europe, but it's really not gaining in popularity. In fact, most nobles would drink it, those of higher um, higher positions in society, and um, it was just mo mostly a ceremonial drink, that chocolatel. They wanted to have it compete with, they wanted drinking chocolate pretty much. They wanted to have it compete with teas and coffee, but it just lost out, okay? It was too bitter, it was too exotic for people, <clears throat> and so they were unable to really make it into a drinkable beverage that actually took popularity. And so, it wasn't until the early 1800s that they actually started finding out ways to, through a process called tempering, they're able to give chocolate mechanical strength and turn it into an actual chocolate bar. The screw press was a serendipitous invention that helped with the production of chocolate. And then adding milk actually lessened the astringency and allowed it to even be more enjoyable and taste sweeter to the public. So that's just a brief history of chocolate right there. We're gonna talk a little bit of about the science of what makes chocolate so so wonderful, right? It stands out among anything else. It kind of when you eat a chocolate bar, it provides an experience unlike anything else. And the reason is, is really, I think, due to cocoa butter, which know that it's not 
picture of unsalted butter. That's what pure cocoa butter looks like. Um, <clears throat> it has these fantastic qualities that make it perfectly suitable for chocolate. Its melting point is there at room temperature to where you can store it as a solid, but then it can be used as lotions and just kind of dissolve or liquefy in your skin or in your mouth whenever you eat the chocolate. Um, it has natural antioxidants, giving it a long shelf life and preventing rancidity. Um, chocolate has many years shelf life, and when you compare that to like dairy products, you know, it's just a few weeks, right? So that's another amazing thing about cocoa butter, and it forms crystals. And I don't have time to really unpack that fully, but there are six known crystal forms that can occur in triglyceride butter crystals, and uh, Type 5 is what chocolatiers are after, and it's the smoothest, sleekest, most velvety. It's the one you're after, and so it's kind of hard to make. And so you can look up plenty of videos on how to temper chocolate and get the right polymorph structure. I don't have time to get into it, but it, cocoa butter does provide you with crystals, and it provides chocolate bars with mechanical strength. That's why it's not all gooey all the time. And depending on which crystal you form in the triglycerides, um, it, it will tell you what kind of chocolate you're going to have, be it the coating on ice creams or the gooey stuff at Chili's or the nice chocolate bars you see in Willy Wonka, okay? So here's a triglyceride. You're going to see it has this backbone with carbons and it has three esters. And this triglyceride, the triglycerides of uh, cocoa butter are primarily composed of palmitic acid, stearic acid, and oleic acid. And notice that the top two are saturated acids or saturated fats. And so this structure stacks pretty well on each other, and it's because of the unique structure of these triglycerides why you can actually get the unique crystal forms that you see in the cocoa butter, thus providing it with the strength you need to make it into a chocolate bar that can then melt in your mouth. Okay? And cocoa butter, I should also say, is used in face creams and things of that sort. And using fats in applications like that shouldn't surprise you, right? Candle wax and shoe polish and things of that sort. Fats are used in many ways, and so we can also ingest these. So let's talk about how it goes from the actual tree all the way to the nice chocolate bar that you enjoy. <clears throat> it starts in these kind of um, regions such as the western coast of Africa or Honduras and places like that. Plenty of rain, exotic environments. You have this cacao tree. You might hear me call it cacao. I've heard it pronounced a, a number of ways, but generally speaking, we call it cacao when it's the unprocessed version of these seeds, and whenever you process it, such as fermentation and roasting, they then call it cocoa. Okay, so that's kind of the nomenclature there. Um, grown in tropical climates in Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Indonesia lead the world in population of these. Um, when you use a machete to hack into this, you're going to see this kind of, I think, kind of looks gross, honestly. Um, when I first look at it, but those are the cacao seeds, and um, they, for, they contain about 50% of the triglyceride cocoa fat or the cocoa butter. Um, it's a very unpleasant taste. If you were to pop one of those in your mouth, it would not resemble chocolate, okay? So that's why I find this so fascinating. How did this ever become the chocolate we know and love? <clears throat> what ends up happening is you harvest these, you combine them, and you pile them up into a heap, and then you let them ferment for up to two weeks, okay? The fermentation is a very important process because what it does is it forms the fruity ester molecules in it. It heats it up and prevents germination into the cocoa plant. And also, um, it produces the precursors that lead to the chocolate flavors. If you skip this step, no chocolate flavor no matter what you do. How they figured that out, again, I have no idea. They just piled it up in a heap, it heats up, and it can take up to two weeks. <coughs> Okay. But even after this, if you were to pop it in your mouth, which I don't suggest, it wouldn't taste very good. So what happens next? Okay. First you grow it, then you harvest it, then you ferment it to get the precursor chocolate flavors. Well then, um, what you have to do is you have to dry it and roast it. Okay. So talking about the fermentation, what happens is the acids and the alcohols within the molecule combine. It's an enzyme catalyzed reaction to produce a variety of ester molecules. Um, it's not just one ester molecule, it's a variety which can lead to the unique flavors that chocolate can give you. The beans are then roasted, as you can see around this cocoa pod, and the roasting process is really important for two reasons. Number one, you get caramelization. I know that's a, a slab of meat, don't worry, I'll talk about <laughs> that, okay? 
first you get the caramelization, which is why the beans kind of turn brown. Uh, in that roasting process, pretty much the carbohydrates are falling apart and breaking off into smaller carbon-containing compounds. The smaller ones vaporize and you can actually smell those. So you start smelling the process happening and it leads to the caramelization. And then when you get really hot, like 160 degrees C or above, you get the Maillard reaction. The reason I show you a nice slab of meat there is because um, without the Maillard reaction, the world wouldn't be as tasty, okay? It's, that's, it's what gives you the kind of the browning on top of meat or um, for instance, the brown on bread when you make freshly baked bread. <clears throat> Essentially, it's the proteins and the carbohydrates reacting together. And then at that temperature, uh, those can then react with some of the fruity ester molecules to unleash a variety of flavor molecules, too many to be counted, okay? So that's a very important process um, in this. But the problem was even after roasting it and everything, it's still not gonna taste great. You still can't get it into a liquid form. So it took engineers inventing the screw press to kind of unleash chocolate's marvelous powers. Van Houten, an English chocolate company, invented the screw press. Um, spare you the details. It allows you to grind up the, the solids of the, the solid components of cocoa into a, a gritty nature, which can, which can then be ground up into a really fine powder. So you're eliminating the grittiness that they were experiencing. And then it separates out the cocoa butter. As you can see, it kind of just drips through and then you can catch it. Well, scientists learned through counterintuitive thinking, what if we were to grind up these solids over here, isolate the cocoa fat here, and then add it in in a proportion mixed with sugar until we actually design a treat that we actually enjoy. So they kind of redesigned the cocoa bean by adding in fats as they saw fit, okay? <clears throat> Pretty amazing, it was definitely counterintuitive and the first chocolate bar was made in 1847 through an English cho chocolate company, Fry and Sons. Um, noteworthy, uh, you had this little boy with his faces of desperation, pacification, expectation, acclimation, and realization. And I did look into the story of this young man and when he was older, he remembers very specifically the desperation and what his dad did is he tied a rag full of soaked in ammonia around his neck to get that picture. <laughs> For those that have smelled ammonia, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> so we're still, at milk, we're still not at milk chocolate, we're still at maybe dark chocolate at best, so even with 30% sugar, it's still kind of astringent because of all these alkaloids. The sugar just isn't enough to counteract um, the amount of bitterness experienced in chocolate. So you have fermented and dried cocoa beans, you separate out the solids from the cocoa fats, and then you add them back together in a proportion to make a recreated cocoa bean. You did your chemical reaction in the, in the actual bean through the fermentation and the roasting and the Maillard reaction. What they decided to do to reduce the astringency is to add milk to it. Now, if it's more than 50% cocoa fat, adding milk doesn't sound like a great idea because like dissolves like, as we've taught y'all, right? And so it's gonna be polar and non-polar. Well, let's talk about that. It's actually a result of Nestle, which was a fledgling little company at the time. Um, they were trying to turn milk from a local commodity into a more of an industrialized commodity. And so they found a good partnership with um, the Swiss to create milk chocolate. <clears throat> Um, they experimented with different types of milks, but pretty much in essence, you need to remove the water from the milk in order to get milk chocolate. So it might come in the form of powdered milk or concentrated milk plus sugar, or milk with the fat removed by enzymes, so on and so forth. But let's just say this, flavor doesn't travel well. And you can be an American, eat milk chocolate, and it tastes a little bit different than maybe European and around the world. And it's because here in America, we like our milk. I think it's the milk, concentrated milk plus sugar, but then I think in Switzerland, could be wrong on the location, but powdered milk is more or less used, and it gives you the subtle difference in flavor, okay? If you've ever had like Toblerone, I might be saying it wrong, but I think those are fantastic. Um, and Hershey with almonds, of course, is a milk chocolate, and I think it's a fabulous treat with the almonds added to it, by the way. <coughs> so here's my final slide on chocolate before we move on to further subjects. Um, many people said they're addicted to chocolate and maybe there's some validity to that. It does contain some psychoactive ingredients such as caffeine and theobromine. Um, theobromine just being the demethylated version of caffeine. Um, theobromine actually means food of the gods. Theo and broma is food. Um, this is actually what contributes to a lot of dogs um, dying when they eat too much chocolate. They're, they can't ingest this in any 
at sufficient levels and expect to live. But um, these are psychoactive ingredients. You need to eat a lot of chocolate actually to experience like the same amount of caffeine, let's say you see in coffee, right? But it's there and perhaps makes you want more. Um, but another consideration is it is a wonderful sensory experience that is unlike any other treat, right? What can you put in your mouth that, it, that unleashes all the flavor molecules at once? You brew coffee, right? And part of your taste comes from what you smell. Maybe y'all heard of that before. <clears throat> and so coffee needs to be, really be drank fast so that you can breathe in the aroma and that contributes to the flavor when you drink it. But you gotta drink it fast because that aroma goes away quick. It's not the case with the chocolate. All the flavors are locked into the chocolate bar and whenever it melts in your mouth, it unleashes all the flavors to you at that moment. It melts in your mouth, kind of creating the liquid hot cocoa by the body temperature. It might create kind of a cooling sensation because it's melting and still in heat from your tongue. Um, meaty flavors, nutty flavors, fruity flavors, it's all there. Chocolate is awesome. And, um, and of course, creates a snap. That might sound kind of weird, but there is a study of psychophysics of that. The snap equates to freshness in our brains, and so sometimes we just like the, the snappiness of chocolate. You know this if ever, if ever you had a Hershey Kiss and it melted into your car and you still tried to eat it in its gooey form. It's just not as good, is it? I don't think it is. So there's that. There's more to say on chocolate. It's expanded into a multi-billion dollar industry. You can find it across the world and finds its way in many applications. So that's my fun way to start this talk. Let's go on to nature's medicine, okay? Keep going. Or monster, okay? Nature's medicine or monster. So anybody know what that is? <clears throat> that's the opium poppy, okay? The opium poppy. Um, there's a lot to be said about opium. Uh, we as humans do experience pain on many levels, and when you experience pain, as George Orwell said, you just wish that it would stop, okay? Pain is not fun. We don't like dealing with it. But the, the thing about it is ancient civilizations from, from the earliest times have found opium to be God's own medicine, almost, is what they would call it. Um, it's one of the most powerful pain relievers or analgesics ever to be discovered. The opium poppy shown here, naturally resistant to insects and fungi, so it can be grown across the world. In fact, Afghanistan has it as its leading uh, cash crop. And uh, ancient cultures didn't know how addictive opium is. There's a lot of history to opium, and I'm gonna do my best to kind of recap it in just a few minutes. <clears throat> but started with ancient cultures. It wasn't, uh, it took a few hundred, if not thousand years before someone start, started to finally sound the alarm that People are getting really addicted to this stuff and it's, they're, they're just, it's not going well, so we need to stop this. But by that point, opium had kind of spread. <clears throat> um, the British started sending it to China. China didn't want the opium in their country, and so that started some of the opium wars, if y'all heard of that. Um, Portuguese brought pipes to China, and so smoking opium was very important to the Chinese at the time. It was a massive epidemic. And uh, Americans weren't so much into smoking it at first, we were drinking it. Maybe y'all heard of laudanum before? Laudanum was the drink, it's opium mixed with brandy. Um, you can see it in To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, typically the women in society were addicted to laudanum and it was considered to be more of a mild, gentler form of addiction. <clears throat> um, but then the California gold rush happened, the Chinese started coming there with their pipes and the opium den started shooting up in all the major cities in America. So then there's a major opium problem in America. It had to be stopped. But first I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what's in opium, because it's kind of important. What is that little white milky liquid that hardens into a black gum known as opium? Well, it contains morphine, codeine, thebane, comes from Thebes, a town in Egypt, papaverine, and noscapine, or narcotine is another name for it. That's what the structures look like. It's going to be a total synthesis question on my next test, opium people. <laughs> Just a joke, okay? The two I really want to focus in on is morphine and thebane, though, because those actually have contributed to a lot of the hurt and heartache of our society and around the world. Let's start with morphine. The main thing is scientists were desperate to use the powerful analgesic properties of these while separating it from addiction. It's a noble task, right? <clears throat> these are opiates after all, and narcotics, and they didn't know the extent of addiction. So this Friedrich Sir Turner was the first to isolate morphine, which is the most um, 
in terms of the opium poppy, um, morphine was the major constituent of those five that I just showed you. So there's more morphine in opium than anything else. <clears throat> he isolated morphine in 1803. He needed to do some experiments on it before proclaiming it to the subject, but at the time, there was no one to do the tests on. He didn't have a degree or worked at a university. He made all of his own lab equipment. And so he's like, okay, I'll try it on myself. Here's what happened. He was addicted to it by the end of his studies, okay? He found it to be, and this might just be, I don't know, might be more anecdotal than anything, but he found it to be six times more potent than opium alone. <clears throat> he was addicted to it, and here's what he said. I consider it my duty to attract attention to the terrible effects of this new substance, uh, which he called morphium at the time, in order that calamity may be averted. Morphium comes from Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams, and so <clears throat> there you have it. Do you think we listened to his? <laughs> no, obviously not. His warnings were ignored, and Merck started producing morphine in droves by 1827s, and doctors soon, soon started prescribing it. But then comes Alexander Wood and his hypodermic syringes, <laughs> okay? And so, uh, yeah, there's morphine, yes, you're taking it, they're prescribing it, but then in 1853 in Scotland, uh, Alexander Wood reasoned that, hey, maybe if you're not ingesting it, you can inject it under your skin, to your bloodstream, immediate effects, and maybe that'll get rid of the whole addictive properties, right? Um, no, that, that didn't work either. Here's one of his hypodermic syringes right here. By 1900, people were self-medicating themselves with morphine with their hypodermic syringes. 300,000 people in the U.S. were addicted to morphine. And a sad story of this is the first recorded intravenous overdose of morphine was his wife, of all people. Okay, kind of sad. Sad history seen with morphine. Laws were soon passed to prevent the sale of morphine. Okay. So we need to turn our attention to something else. We, we need to not look for the natural ones, which we call opiates. That does mean opiates are derived from the natural sources, whereas opioids are the syn synthetic compounds derived from the natural sources. Let's try diacetylmorphine. And <clears throat> so C.R. Alder Wright boiled morphine in acetic anhydride to get diacetylmorphine right here. Kind of makes sense. I mean, for those that know how to make aspirin, you can acetylate salicylic acid and then it doesn't produce gastritis and bleeding. Helps it uh, get into your bloodstream quicker at a lower dose. Sounds like a smart idea. So let's acetylate it. He did. <clears throat> he actually fed this gray powder to his dog and saw very adverse effects, but he went ahead and published his findings. Um, he said this is a deplorable thing. But he did publish it, so Heinrich Dreiser, who worked for Bayer at the time, um, saw this and thought, hey, this is a miracle drug. I mean, acetylating, I already know about aspirin, that worked. Maybe this will work. Let's acetylate morphine and, and that'll go good for us. So he experimented on some rats and a handful of people four weeks worth of research. <laughs> he presented his findings at this National uh, 70th Congress of German Naturalists and Physicians, and he received a standing ovation for this. Bayer was so impressed, they wanted to start mass producing this compound, in which they wanted to call it Miracle. Um, he didn't like that name. He wanted to kind of talk about how heroic it is as a chemical. <laughs> this compound is heroin. Okay. <laughs> That's surprising? <laughs> yeah. This is heroin. And um, as y'all know, heroin was a disaster, okay? <clears throat> but it might also surprise you that everybody was prescribing it. It was over the counter. Um, at the time, they were telling pregnant women to use it, and it contributed to the death of a lot of um, babies in the womb. It's a really sad thing if you think about it, and those that were born had severe withdrawal. Um, so it's time to turn our attention to maybe another strategy, right? So kind of getting weary of all these uh, this opium-derived compounds. And so they said, let's, let's back off the whole morphine thing and let's target the bane, or the bane, as you saw, it was another one of those opium compounds. Well, if you just do an oxidation and reduction, you can get oxycodone. This is more recent, and you've probably heard of oxycodone. You'll see it um, mingled with other drugs to produce Percocet, Percodan, and Combinox you know, ibuprofen, aspirin, and that thing. But then there's Oxycontin, which I really want to focus in on. What Oxycontin is, is pure Oxycodone, uncut with other drugs, okay? Now they thought they were clever when they first marketed this. They said, let's, let's combine it with an acrylic to have a slow release so that you get this pain relief throughout the day. 
it didn't take long for people to realize you can just crush it up in your mouth or just find a way to crush it up and you can get 160 milligrams immediately into your bloodstream. People were overdosing. Uh, I have some quick facts right here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but there is a lot to be said about oxycodone. It's even suggested on the per weight basis. It's more powerful than morphine. Um, it's kind of sickening because <clears throat> doctors found that this was a gold mine, right? You can get patients in and out quickly. You can, uh, you know, incur a lot of profit. Um, and pharmacists realized, hey, like, y'all are prescribing way too much. But then pill mills started popping up. One guy uh, was prescribing so much, he might see 150 patients a day, and his parking lot looked more like a sporting event than a doctor's office. Tailgate parties, and when they had their prescription, they were like waving and people would clap for them. Um, teen addiction started. It really spread throughout the Ohio Valley regions and eastern Kentucky. Some even referred to it as hillbilly heroin. Um, it was a really big problem. I mean, some, some rural high schools had over 80% of people that experimented with this, and more than more than 50% of those got, um, got into it more than just one time. It was a habit-forming drug. <clears throat> now, they were so weary of uh, using opioids and opiates for drugs, so doctors backed off of this one. So how did it ever pick up momentum? Well, it, maybe Cicely Saunders is the reason. Um, she is pictured here, and she is the leader of the hospice movement. She didn't think that people should die in pain, and so they're like, well, if you have a terminal illness, let's pump them full of oxycodone or something like that, and then they can die in peace with dignity. But then Russell Portnoy, right here, he's a pain specialist. He said people need to get over their opiophobia. We need to start prescribing these things. He tried to use pain as another vital sign in conjunction with blood pressure and heart rate and um, temperature. <clears throat> and he said pain should be another one. So people started, well, he was so accomplished when he spoke, people listened, you know. So he was, he rose to meteoric success and so published plenty of papers, had a lot of charisma. So when he spoke, people listened. So then doctors said, well, Portnoy says we can do it. Let's start prescribing again. It became a disaster, okay. And we're still kind of dealing with oxycodone right now. So here's my final thoughts on the whole opium section of this talk. Pain relief, addictions, profit, and backfire. Morphine, same conclusions. Heroin, same conclusions. <laughs> Oxycodone, same conclusions. In fact, some doctors have found that just physical therapy, healthy diet, that would actually, um, that, that has just as much pain relief as these medications, but it was just cheaper to not do physical therapy and just drug yourself up. And so that's what they did. <clears throat> so we need data before we start implementing stuff throughout society. Anything less than that is very nearsighted. Four weeks of testing heroin before <laughs> presenting it to the Congress, not great. So toxicology students, you all ready for the war on mosquitoes? <laughs> I'm gonna try not to step on anybody's toes. I'm gonna try to play the middle ground, just kind of talking about this compound. You had this Austrian chemist, Othman Ziedler. He was trying to finish up his dissertation, so he took chloral, mixed it with uh, chlorobenzene in excess in a friedel crafts fashion. He designed this trichloroethane <clears throat> molecule, dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane. It sat on the shelf until Mueller, trying to get rid of moths, clothes moths, found this chemical and found that it killed a lot of things, moths, fleas, ticks, lice, mosquitoes, and flies. And it could be used to actually kill typhus in Europe. That was the, one, one of the original intents of this compound. This compound is actually known as DDT. Many of y'all have heard of it, and it's now one of the most controversial molecules ever synthesized. This one right here. This is Rachel Carson. <clears throat> you can see by her lifespan, she didn't live long. Cancer took her out uh, rather early. But she was a <coughs> conservationist known as the mother of mo modern environmentalism, and she was very influential in her writings. Silent Spring is one of them <clears throat> that probably had the most success, and she as I understand it, wrote with great poetic language and biblical overtones, and she pretty much convinced the world that we need to watch out for all these chemical pesticides that we're just putting onto our planet. It's killing things, it's killing the birds, it's killing the insects. We need to live in harmony with the world. <clears throat> People actually listen. Through her efforts, DDT was successfully banned in the U.S. in 1972. Okay? And there's a whole lot more to say about Rachel Carson and her successes, 
It's just given the constraints today, I can't talk too much about her. Now DDT was actually, it, it worked, okay? That's one thing I do wanna say about it. And so I have this slide called DDT the Good, and you can see when it first came onto the scene, it was very, it was received in a positive light. DDT is good for me, that's the molecule. South Africa reduced a ton of malaria cases. Taiwan reduced a lot of malaria cases. Sardinia, a lot of malaria cases. America, malaria free by 1952. World Health Organization launched a global campaign and as a result, 11 countries are declared malaria free. Nepal really benefited from it, increasing the lifespan from 28 years to 48 years. And you can even see this little advertisement, this woman just spraying her cabinets with DDT. It can be found everywhere, right? So what's the bad, Morris? Why, why is DDT so bad? It looks to be super effective. Well, it bioaccumulates, okay? I've read anywhere between, uh, well, it's called a persistent organic pollutant, which means it just kind of likes to stay in the soil for a long time, 22 days to 30 years. Yikes. <clears throat> You'd see actually planes would fly over and just dust the fields. And let me just be clear, Carson wasn't necessarily against DDT. She wanted to be more strategic. Let's not just spray it everywhere. Let's find target areas where it's maybe smarter to kill all the mosquitoes and whatnot. <clears throat> it's toxic, toxic to some marine animals. Dr. Dyer sent me an article and apparently it's really aggressive to sea lions. Um, they just found a DDT uh, overload on the coast, on the Pacific coast, right? <clears throat> Lipophilic, it stores in body fats. Um, again, in talking to Dr. Dyer, there's a good chance that if you were to look at your cells and dig up into your fat cells, there might be DDT in you right now because it just lasts that long, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean that it's toxic, but in sufficient amounts, it can definitely become toxic. Thins the eggshells of birds. It's an endocrine disruptor, considered likely to be a carcinogen. Um, People are just playing in it, like those fog machines. I grew up around, like people would just spray these fog machines, just playing in it. And of course, mosquitoes and insects were starting to develop resistance. There's no surprise there. <clears throat> so I just wanted to frame the controversy. There's a lot to be said, books, DDT wars and whatnot. But due to time, I have to kind of wrap up the DDT discussion. Stricter regulations were necessary. Rachel Carson had enormous success in her environmentalism. In fact, here's what her legacy inspired, if you have time to read that, okay? It was very important for American and other countries to realize we need to be held accountable for what we're doing to our environment. She was incredibly important. But I also don't want to downplay, DDT did work. I mean, we're malaria free right now and mostly children suffer, right, from the disease. And there's efforts to get rid of malaria still, don't get me wrong. But like I said, it worked. I think many of y'all would agree, misinformation on the internet abounds regarding this subject. And so that causes more confusion with society. <clears throat> um, we're blessed to have professionals here that have studied it in depth to illuminate us on this subject. We all need to consider our environment and the harmful effects synthesized products can have on it. And uh, like I said, we're still dealing with bioaccumulation, but I think y'all would agree with me that this is a notorious molecule to talk about. Now, I'm about 10 minutes left, and I'm at my favorite part of the talk, so I apologize if I go fast. <laughs> Humanity's hero and villain, okay? There was a major problem. Sir William Crookes in England at the British Academy of Sciences says, England and all nations stand in deadly peril. Why did he say that? Well, we have plenty of hydrogen from water, we get oxygen from the air, which comes from plants. We get carbon from photosynthesis, CO2, carbohydrates are synthesized, but the weakest link in the chain is nitrogen. Um, it comes from the soil, and we can get nitrogen in the soil in various ways, I'll, I'll talk about that. But if nitrogen runs out, life on our planet won't last much longer, okay? And uh, starvation will start to happen. In fact, perfectly farming a vegetarian, with perfect farming in a vegetarian society, you would only feed about 4 billion people, and last I checked, we have more than 4 billion people on this planet, right? William Crookes knew that people would start dying. When that was going to happen, how fast that was going to happen, that was, that was debated. But if it would happen, was not debated. It was going to happen. So the question is, how are we able to feed so many people 
why is about 50% of the nitrogen in our body from synthetic fertilizers? Okay. I'm going to frame the problem in this way. It starts with Fritz Haber, and the, the, the problem is this. Well, I'll talk about it in just a second. Here's some quick facts on Fritz Haber. I can give you more and more information. I don't want to overwhelm you all, but what I do want to focus in on is what I, am, uh, what I highlighted there. <clears throat> he had a troubled relationship with his father, and you might think that that's just a side note, but I think it actually spurred him to pursue his studies and then caused him to live such a different kind of life, let's just say. And I think with his troubled relationship with his father, it led to his devotion to instead his father land. In case you're wondering, he was alive during World War I and World War II. And after Crook's speech shown at the top of the previous slide, he took it upon himself to be one of the many researchers trying to find ways to get nitrogen from the air that we're breathing right now into the soil to where it can be usable, okay? So here's the problem. The equation's simple. Hydrogen plus nitrogen goes to ammonia. Ammonia would be very good at serving as a synthetic fertilizer. It okay, can easily be converted to nitrites and nitrates and then used. <clears throat> the problem is that nitrogen in air is not just a single nitrogen atom, but it's two nitrogens held together by a triple bond. If you check your chemistry textbooks, it's listed as uh, odorless, colorless, unreactive, inert, all that stuff. It's really hard to break that triple bond. And so for the soil, it's unusable. We have plenty of it. 78, 79% of our air is nitrogen, but it was unusable nitrogen. Doesn't that kind of stink? Like, here's all the nitrogen up here, but we can't really use it for, for good things. <clears throat> well, with a English chemist, Robert Le Rosignol, he developed this two-foot tabletop apparatus shown there, designed out of quartz and iron, <laughs> capable of withstanding temperatures that would melt copper and capable of withstanding pressures that would crush a submarine. He was going to heat this thing up, and he was going to produce ammonia. Okay, um, Carl Bosch who was a um, kind of a chemical engineer at BASF, which is a German word. I don't know what it really stands for. He industrialized the process. Not an easy task. They tested over, I wish I had this <laughs> kind of capability. They tested over 4,000 different catalysts and 20,000 separate experiments. I still, to this day, don't know what the catalyst was, but whenever Haber, or Haber was able to um, get this to work, he was using an osmium catalyst mm -hmm. at the time. I think it's probably more protected now. But you can see them spraying this, and they were able to start producing 60,000 tons of NH3 annually just at this one plant. Okay, That sounds good. Doesn't this guy deserve a Nobel Prize for this? Maybe both of them do. Fun fact, 1918, Haber did receive a Nobel Prize in Stockholm. Fun fact, Carl Bosch, 1930s, received a Nobel Prize. First to receive a Nobel Prize for industrializing a process he didn't invent. Okay. And there is a dark side to synthetic fertilizers. We can uh, have that discussion at lunch, but not all of it winds up in your crops, and then it promotes the growth of algae and creates dead zones and things of that sort, and also acid rain through the emissions of these plants. Fritz Haber was also involved in chemical warfare. So Germany was a war machine, as y'all might know, and he found in a one-step process you can convert ammonia at these plants into nitrates. Nitrates are explosives, very explosive. Y'all might have heard of Timothy McVeigh bombing that um, government building in downtown Oklahoma City with nitrates. Um, in a one-step process, BASF and other plants that were making ammonia became explosive plants in a one-step process, ammonia to nitrates. They needed these nitrates in order to fuel their war machine, pretty much. <clears throat> World War I became the chemist war, according to Haber. Okay? He says, our soldiers might not be braver, our generals might not have more wit, but we have the smarter chemists and we're going to win this. Okay? And if y'all know the history, they didn't. But <laughs> anyways, he would later be branded a war criminal because of the Hague Conventions, which says you can't really use chemical warfare to kill people. You might say, British used uh, tear gas. Yeah, that temporarily hurt people. He wanted, to, uh, he wanted to design agents that would kill you. They would creep on the ground, low density, or very dense, creep on the ground, go in the trenches, and suffocate you. He was successful. Chlorine gas, over uh, 15, 150 tons of chlorine gas was released. He killed 5,000 people in Ypres, Belgium, um, the second battle of Ypres. 
He used phosgene gas because it acted a lot like chlorine, but it was more potent. You can use it in lower concentrations. But even the worst was the sulfur mustard, which isn't technically a gas. It's more like vapors. But this one's really bad because it sticks to everything, and you can't really wash it off. So even after the war, it was on farming equipment and houses, and then it still had effects of killing people long after the attack. Um, and it also creates burns similar to second degree burns on your skin. It's really awful stuff. Um, there was a dispute with his wife, Clara, who also had a PhD in chemistry over this incident, and she took a gun and ended her life. Um, didn't matter to Fritz, the next day he went off to a new city to continue his work. Okay, so he was obviously very devoted to Germany at this point. I mentioned he did win a Nobel Prize in 1918 along with Max Planck and Johannes Stark. Um, <clears throat> Y'all probably heard of these names, Doppler effect and quantum, um, <coughs> quantum studies. Um, but it was the first time a Nobel Prize was actually boycotted, okay, because of his efforts creating the Germany war machine using chemical warfare. I didn't even mention this. They also used some of these chemical warfare in, in their artillery, too. And so they were just violating everything that the Hague Convention set forth. Um, and so, yes, he saved a lot of lives, but he killed a lot of lives using his brilliance as well. So people didn't like him. In fact, two Frenchmen rejected them, their Nobel Prizes, suggesting Fritz Haber was morally unfit for this honor. Um, others refused to shake his hand. After the release of chlorine gas, look who was there with him. Hans Geiger, the Geiger counter. Gustav Hertz, the nephew of Heinrich Hertz from physics, right? <clears throat> and uh, James Franck, both of which won the Nobel Prize um, in kind of paving the way for the Bohr model. And uh, Karl Bosch, like I said, won the Nobel Prize also. So the Haber-Bosch process, this is Bosch. Um, he ended up um, dying I think about 20 years after this Nobel Prize in 31, due to depression and alcoholism because of what Germany became with Hitler's rise. Okay. So, I, I didn't talk a lot about his uh, Haber's relationships, but he did develop a relationship, a friendship with Albert Einstein. Uh, essentially, Einstein offered to tutor his son while he helped Einstein get through a difficult separation with his wife. Um, they had polar opposite political views, Einstein being more liberal, wisecrack, you know, and Haber wants to enlist in the army and devoted to Germany. <clears throat> Sadly enough, Haber, or Haber, he uh, was Jewish by his ancestry. He got baptized and converted to Christianity to help his job prospects, but ultimately he embraced his Judaism towards the end of his life. Um, Hitler had him fire and other Germans that worked under him, and it just got really bad. He was very upset because when he put in his resignation, they didn't even beg him to stay, and he was just, he was just depressed after that. Um, just one year after Hitler rose to power, Fritz Haber did die on his way to a kind of meaningless job. He died in Switzerland. Um, but here's what we can say about Fritz Haber. Chemistry is not performed in isolation. You can see how massively culture can influence how you use your chemistry for the good or bad. We need a wealth of information and we need to have these discussions to talk about the impacts of what the chemist can do. As you can see, here's Fritz Haber with a shaved head. He was trying to look more German, Kaiser-like. <clears throat> There's Albert Einstein with him. We need to be mindful of our actions. <coughs> there he is, that's the young Fritz Haber. And you can tell here that he decided to be buried in Switzerland with a very small gravestone um, with his wife, Clara. He did remarry, but he still asked that they would uh, take her body and bring it to Switzerland to be buried by him so he could be buried by his first wife. Final thoughts, what do we do with this information? I mean, is this just a fun little science seminar where you learn a lot of history or do we actually, are we gonna learn from this? Is it kind of interesting how all this played out in history? Maybe you didn't even know about the heroin and morphine stuff. Humans have acted impulsively and caused much harm, but there have also been much good brought to the world thanks to hard working scientists. Okay? There's no doubt about that. So I'm not trying to paint scientists or chemists as villains, okay? There has been a lot of good, a lot of good. Here's what I talked about today. Chocolate, opium, DDT, synthetic fertilizers and chemical warfare. Um, I hope that this is a good summary slide to kind of bring, bring it around what all we talked about, how chemistry has impacted our daily lives. Be inspired by these stories, but be wary of the misuse of science. 
and of course, be a blessing to this world. Okay, it's our job as Christians, and uh, and I think we just need to try to not be so focused on our title and accomplishments, and actually think of the big picture when we're trying to implement these things to society. Thank you so much for your time. It contributes to the formation of dead zones, which pretty much chokes off oxygen and sunlight and then the fish populations. Help me out, Dr. Dyer, but uh, it's dead zones. There's been over 150 dead zones spotted around the world, but the one in the Gulf is one of the largest. It's bigger than New Jersey, um, mostly because the Mississippi River is pouring in a lot of that, the nitrates and nitrogen. But yeah, there's a, lot, there's a dark side to fertilizers. I did originally have a slide talking about it, but I knew I didn't have enough time to get too deep into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So then, is there a happy medium there where, like, <laughs> certain um, things need fertilizers? <clears throat> so, ammonia works, and when you're trying to fertilize a whole field of crops, just like that picture I showed, I guess ammonia is one of the most effective. Um, it's my understanding the fertilizer we use, like, for our lawns, like weed and feed, it's not necessarily ammonia, um, some sort of soluble nitrogen polymer plastic that works, but um, on the large scale, I think ammonia is still number one. Oh. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. If you've got more <laughs> questions, um, Dr. Morris will be here and he'll also be at lunch. Otherwise, we'll see you all next week for another science seminar. Let's thank Dr. Morris again.